Okay, well, we have a lot to uh, cover today, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, hello, uh, listeners. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, 2022 going into 2023 California cannabis updates. Um, and with me today are Andrea Golan and Genevieve Mian. Um, I'm uh, in snowy Mammoth Lakes right now um, with less than uh, optimal internet speed. So hopefully no issues with the presentation today. Um, we had thought originally that November 8th, yesterday, um, election day was going to be the release date for the consolidated permanent cannabis regulations, but due to some uh, nuances of timing at the state level, um, I'm now hearing that it's going to be sometime next week, um, maybe the 15th or possibly the 20th, that the uh, permanent consolidated regulations become effective. Um, but we are not expecting substantive revisions to the version that's already been released uh, to the extent, uh, <laughs> I'm seeing a comment that it's gonna be at Christmas. Um, yes, I'm sure that's probably accurate. Um, the state's, the state's uh, methodologies on, on uh, their timeframe for these things are always uh, quite mystical um, to the outside observer. Um, but if there are, you know, significant substantive changes to what we've seen already, we'll provide updates, um, but we're not expecting that currently. Um, I, I do want to note, though, that since we haven't seen the final draft of the regulations, um, we're not uh, completely sure what type of transition period they'll provide um, for existing products to transition to um, um, I'm just going to turn off the chat because I keep getting distracted by it. Um, for the you know existing products to transition to the um, the new requirements, there aren't a lot of significant uh, packaging and labeling changes, which are usually some of the um, primary um, uh, you know changes. But you know in the past, um, these are non-emergency regulations. In the past, non-emergency quote permanent regulations have become effective on January one. And that was also the transition date for, you know, transitioning over to um, the new requirements. So uh, we'll keep that in mind. And that's kind of my operating assumption right now. But obviously, operators that have existing inventory are, you know, focused on, on that question. And we really haven't heard um, anything from the state thus far on it, despite asking a lot of questions. So, um, Guy, could I have the next slide, please? And then next. So the, the goals of the, the session today are essentially operationalizing um, uh, 2022 changes for operators going into 2023. Um, we've seen an uptick in compliance um, and uh, inspections, audits, both on the um, facility side and obviously on the tax side as well. So we wanted to contextualize that in the context of these new regulations as well to um, try to help people prepare and provide some um, anecdotes from what we've seen from other operators that have gone through inspections and audits of late. Um, changes to cannabis business taxes. I think most people who are, who are on the session are probably aware of the change from uh, collection of the excise tax from distribution to retail starting on January 1, as well as the at least temporary termination of the cultivation tax as of July 1 of this year. Um, but we'll dig into a, a few more details on those items um, and then cover, um, in addition to the um, AB 195 changes, the um, what we anticipate to be the latest permanent regulations, which I think is probably the second or third set of permanent regulations that we've seen in California to date, um, and how to uh, prepare. So, uh, Guy, next slide, please. Um, digging into first uh, some of the primary regulatory changes um, that are impacting operators with these new regulations, they have made some changes to the definitions of um, owners and financial interest holders and the disclosures. And I put this as the first slide because those disclosures impact almost all operators in the state, um, whether you're an owner or a brand with an IP licensing agreement, you know, these are of, of significant interest. They didn't change as much on the owner side, um, but they did specify that on the look-through basis, 
that um, anybody who's considered an owner by virtue of management or direction um, or control of the actual licensed entity will have to be disclosed. So in the past, this has been um, kind of an analyst specific analysis where if we disclose um, applications or modifications with multiple tiers of owner entities, um, the DCC would sometimes require um, you know, disclosure as owners of those uh, managers or other individuals at the hold co levels. Um, sometimes they would require live scans and sometimes they would treat them as financial interest holders and just require um, basic disclosure. Um, and so hopefully this gives some direction, additional direction to the DCC analysts who have always retained a lot of discretion uh, moving forward to say, okay, if this individual at a whole co-level does not have anything to do with the day-to-day -day operations of the um, license entity, then you know, they, they'll be, they should be disclosed as NFIH at most, but we'll see um, how that how that works out. I would not be surprised if it didn't result in a huge operational change at the DCC, just given the course of, um, you know, performance with the, the degree of discretion that the analysts have. Um, they used to, they, they did remove the provision stating that a 20% or more profit uh, sharing interest is defined as an owner. Um, that's something of a significant change. And then on the financial interest holder side, they included the floor of 10%. So moving over to 15004, the FIH side, um, that floor um, for financial interest holders of 10%, either on a profit sharing basis or on an owner basis is um, a change that's been in effect since fall of 2021 um, with the emergency regulations. And um, you know this is really streamlined disclosures uh, which has been a benefit to most operators. Um, it, it has had uh, impacts to uh, the supply chain, um, particularly with IP licensing agreements. Uh, we work with a lot of brands. Previously, um, the, the sort of working wisdom, I think, on this topic was that if you are an unlicensed brand mm -hmm. with any kind of um, IP licensing arrangement, um, co-packing relationship, it was better to disclose as an FIH to kind of cover your bases, even if you didn't have a traditional profit sharing arrangement. And, you know, over the past four or five years, we've heard different directives from DCC leadership on that topic. And it seemed to be kind of a, a safe bet. So a lot of the supply chain contracts that you'll see out there, you know, reference sort of mandatory FIH filings, et cetera. Um, and it gave brands sort of some comfort to feel like, okay, if we're disclosed as a financial interest holder, if this is called out in the regulations, we're operating in compliance with California law. There's been no real enforcement around this topic that I'm aware of. So um, it's it's been something of a, a hypothetical exercise for lawyers and their clients. Uh, but now that language has been, you know, put at 10%. And unless uh, a brand has a significant relationship with uh, with a co-packer or, or white labeler, um, there's there's they may not may or may not meet that threshold. So, um, you know, guidance for supply chain contracts, you know, moving forward, you might want to look at the terms of your agreement and see if those um, disclosures are mandatory or optional. Um, and then kind of discuss as a brand how you want to, um, you know, treat this moving forward. I've, I've personally stopped recommending that all of our brands disclose as FIH if they clearly don't meet that threshold, because there doesn't seem to be much difference um, to date, at least in how they're treated um, and how their products are treated at the state level. So those are kind of my major takeaways from these changes, at least. Um, next slide. Thanks, Cassia. Um, so I'm going to speak to some of the key, some of the other key definitional changes in the final regs. <clears throat> so beginning first with uh, cannabis product, uh, these final regs clarify that the definition of cannabis products is referenced throughout the regs uh, means manufactured products. One five zero zero SS amends the definition of mixed light to align with the statute, Mount Cursa, um, which provides that mixed light includes the use of natural and artificial light, but does not include light deprivation. 
um, that adds to the prohibition on marketing cannabis goods as alcoholic beverages. Uh, just to clarify that brand names or trade names, companies that are associated with alcoholic beverages can still appear in labeling and in marketing and advertising, um, as long as it doesn't create the impression that the product is an alcoholic beverage. Um, 15700 amends the definition of total THC so that the total THC calculation now includes both delta nine, delta eight, and of course, of course, THCA. Next slide, please. So uh, the DCC added a definition for terpenes in the final regs. Uh, as important here, terpenes must be naturally occurring and contribute to the natural flavor or aroma of the cannabis. Um, that means you can't use um, artificial flavors or flavors that, um, you know, mask the natural uh, flavor or aroma um, of cannabis. And relatedly for inhalable products, licensees can add terpenes that are naturally occurring as, as defined, um, as well as cannabis concentrate, rolling papers, et cetera but all other inactive ingredients in inhalable products must be ones that are on the FDA inactive ingredient list specifically for products intended for inhalation. Um, it's easy to look at that list. You can Google search it and, and type in any ingredient and see if it's on that, a, on that FDA list. It's, it's a pretty limited list. Uh, next slide. So the DCC also added additional requirements for tinctures. Um, the intent is to further distinguish tinctures from um, edibles, specifically um, uh, beverages. So this new um, amended section, or actually it's a new section, requires that tinctures can be no more than two fluid ounces. Um, and it must include, the product must include a calibrated dropper, or a similar device for measuring each serving. Uh, 17302.1 also uh, adds language that the tincture can contain other ingredients aside from extract, cannabis extract, that is alcohol, vegetable oil, or glycerin, but the primary ingredient by weight must be alcohol, vegetable oil, or glycerin. Next slide. Okay, some AB 195 um, changes going back to the tax collection and calculation piece. Um, I think everybody's aware that the cultivation tax was discontinued as of July 1st, as of now. Um, that's not permanent for all time. Uh, it also does not relieve any existing liability for cultivation taxes payable in arrears prior to July 1st. Um, and we've seen CDTFA, you know, make, I think, a lot of these changes to the tax policies to try to improve their collections um, after uh, some difficulties, it appears, in, the, in the, these first, you know, four years after they started auditing um, in, in getting that money from the distributors, um, given that the distributors themselves have had a hard time, um, you know, receiving and tracking these payments, uh, both on the cultivation tax and on the excise tax side, um, as well as the taxes being too high for the industry to um, really flourish and succeed. Uh, so there's been multiple problems. Uh, the response, which is, you know, did not go as far as the industry wanted, but uh, is, a, is a first step, at least, is uh, the elimination of the cultivation tax. And then starting on January 1st, um, reassessment, reassignment of the excise tax calculation, as well as the new calculation to retailers away from distribution. Um, it's going the new rate will be based on what was formerly the non arms length um, calculation, meaning that it's a 15% excise tax payable on the gross receipts and the state has adopted um, some specific definitions of what counts uh, for purposes of gross receipts. Um, it's uh, primarily um, everything besides non cannabis sales. There will be um, it's already popping up some conflicts between the state's definition of what counts as gross receipts and some of the localities 
uh, definitions. Um, for example, I think Los Angeles's excise tax uh, law requires it to be calculated on top of the state law. So there's a, a chicken and egg scenario and it will um, require probably some additional um, dialogue with CDTFA. And I'm confident that they're going to say that their, that their uh, definitions and laws will have primacy over local governments. So uh, consult with your CPA uh, on questions around gross receipts and the calculation there. Um, the first retailer excise tax returns will be due May 1st, and they will be required to obtain a you know, new special permit from CDTFA uh, for that purpose. And as a nod to uh, the distributors who have existing tax obligations and have been undergoing audits, um, part of the discussion between uh, major distributors in California and CTFA was that um, considering that payment of the excise tax to date was really a joint and several liability between the distributors and retailers, but payable by the distributors, CDTFA did um, include an April 1st, 2023 deadline in AB 195 for payment of the you know, pre-Jan 1, 2022 and earlier taxes, excise taxes to the distributors. Um, so I think we'll see CDTFA in the future um, taking a closer look at retailers and um, you know, making sure that those are paid, especially to the extent that they know that the distributors haven't paid it. And at this point, quite a few uh, major distributors in the state have been under audit, uh, and uh, CDTFA has you know, quite, quite a bit of visibility into those records. Next slide. Uh, the fine print on, on AB 195, I've had a couple uh, clients inquire about, and so wanted to, to highlight, particularly given um, the uh, sort of struggles that the industry has been going through in California right now um, with, with um, unfortunately, many companies or at least a larger number than previously considering um, folding up shop because of the expenses of, of operating and, and you know, CapEx um, and lack of available um, additional funding, et cetera. They, because of the difficulties that CBTFA has had in collecting the excise tax and probably cultivation tax as well to date, um, I, they, you know, there's a new section that they adopted in 195 um, that would uh, tries to impose uh, personal liability on cannabis principles for payment of the excise tax and cultivation tax if the building is, sorry, if the business is being wound down or terminated. And that's applicable only if the failure to pay those uh, cannabis cultivation and excise tax is the result of a uh, intentional, conscious, or voluntary course of action. It has to be a willful decision um, not to pay the excise tax. Um, I, you know, we talked to Tracy West at CDTFA about this provision and how CDTFA. Um, envisions it being enforced. I haven't personally seen it enforced yet uh, since it was adopted this summer, but certainly it's been an area of concern and we've received questions about what does willful mean um, if we're winding down our business and we're forced to pay payroll taxes, for example, is that willful that we haven't paid um, excise tax first? I think arguably that would not be a willful situation. It's more, we're going, if their situation was, we're going to wind down the company and, you know, go out of business rather than pay, you know, without paying these obligations or paying off other obligations first. And CDTFA has a lot of mechanisms, including tax liens and judgments, et cetera, to, um, you know, work with taxpayers to get that money before uh, wind down. So I think it remains to be seen how, um, how significant these uh, regulations are uh, in practice against taxpayers, but I think it's worth um, noting them for operators. Obviously, and um, there's already personal liability on EDD, um, you know, payroll tax, um, and so this this should be a consideration at least in, in a wind down. The regulation is not, or sorry, the statute is not um, specific. Uh, it does not indicate that it has retroactive effect. So. Um, you know, I, CDTFA says that they'll be adopting implementing regulations to describe more how this will play out on a quote emergency basis. But I mean, I heard that from uh, Tracy West several months ago and I haven't seen anything more to that effect. So 
unclear when the emergency will start and when the regulations will come out, but wanted to highlight that. Next slide. Thanks very much, Cassia. Um, now we're going to dive into a couple of the changes that we've seen recently that will impact day-to-day -day operations. Um, these are changes that managers and on-site staff should be aware of. Um, a lot of them do capture best practices that we've already seen implemented on site, but now that they are um, implemented into the final rules, we want to make sure everyone's aware um, of how to move forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, we'll kick off with some of the changes to the track and trace requirements. Um, while we're all now quite familiar with the process for receiving our tags within three calendar days when they're received um, at the facility into metric, um, we were previously not required to notify DCC if we did not receive the tags. Um, the final rules now do require that notification. Um, the final regulations are also requiring that all cannabis products stored or held in a container, the package tag should be affixed to the container holding the cannabis and the products. Um, and then each unit inside should also be individually labeled with the UID. Um, if cannabis products are in multiple containers, which is often the case, um, the package tag should be affixed to one of the containers. And then the UID should be uh, labeled on each of the additional containers, but stored in a contiguous manner, in other words, all in one group, so it's clearly identifiable and organized in the event of an audit. Um, finally, uh, retailers can now accept electronic certificates of analysis and utilize metric for lab results, which is a long awaited change for many. Um, so no need to kind of funnel along a huge packet of paper uh, for those certificates certificates of analysis. I did see a quick question pop up. Yes, the blue package tags are the metric tags that we're talking about. Um, next slide. Um, regarding shipping and return transfers, um, the final regulations are requiring that during pickup or receipt of cannabis products, both licensees are confirming that the products received are as described on the shipping manifest and record the acceptance in metric. Um, this has already been implemented by a lot of the operators that we are working with as a best practice, uh, but the regulations are requiring that any discrepancies between type or quantity of cannabis um, are rejected in a timely fashion. Um, we're kind of streamlining the approach here, um, and if we move on to the next slide, there's um, seemingly less flexibility to facilitate a return. Um, but the final regulations do outline circumstances where a partial rejection rather than a full rejection of the shipment can occur. Um, this includes a portion of the shipment that differs from the sales invoice um, and includes things like damaged products, products that don't meet quality or packaging standards. Um, the originating licensee will accept that rejected shipment back into metric on their side. Next slide, we've got some changes to security measures and storage of inventory. Um, many of the changes to security measures and storage of inventory that are in the final regulations are also already implemented as a best practice. Um, we're already seeing things um, such as employee break rooms um, separated from day-to-day -day inventory areas or, or areas where you're uh, working with cannabis product. Um, and we're also already seeing requirements around sign-in and sign-out procedures for anyone that's accessing the licensed premises, um, including authorized individuals, other licensees. Um, the regulations are now requiring, however, that bathrooms and changing facilities are separated utilizing a floor to ceiling solid wall. Um, so if those are not already in place at your facilities, they will need to be. Um, employee break areas do not need to be separated by a solid wall, uh, but they do need to be a clear and distinct area. Um, previously, shipping containers were not formally authorized as temporary storage space, but in the new regulations, they are. This does require proper advanced notification to DCC of the temporary storage space and the premises change. Um, and then I also wanted to note, in addition to other requirements that manufacturers are moving through, such as product quality plans, master manufacturing protocol, et cetera, um, there's also now a written security plan required for manufacturers. Next slide. Of course, I'm on mute. Uh, so these are pretty straightforward um, packaging and labeling changes. Uh, 17402 clarifies that the immediate, the immediate container that's holding the cannabis product um, 
only needs to um, be labeled with a universal symbol. There's no longer a requirement that it have the net quantity of contents um, on it or the product identity. Uh, just the universal symbol is required on the immediate container that holds the cannabis. Uh, 17406 removes the requirement to include the date of manufacturing and packaging on the information panel. Um, instead, only the date of packaging is required. And 17410 gives some uh, leeway in the universal symbol, color, symbol colors by permitting the symbol to be um, not just in black, but in black or white. Next slide, please. So there's been a, a few updates to the delivery rules. Um, 15402 curbside delivery, um, it gives a little bit more leeway to the previous requirement that customers had to be parked immediately outside the premises. Um, now licensees can designate a certain area um, for curbside delivery, as long as they meet all the other um, regulatory requirements. Um, Section 15415, delivery employees, um, is also a, a nice addition, and um, it seems like the DCC was also listening here. Um, you know, delivery employees that are out um, and finish their last delivery don't have to return to the premises um, if they're not carrying any more cannabis goods in the vehicle. You know, if they're close to home, they can go home, uh, which, is, which is a nice amendment. Next slide, please. Uh, also changes to the um, vehicle storage requirements. Um, cannabis goods can be stored in a fully enclosed trunk or in a secured area. Um, a secured area is an area um, where solid or locking metal partitions, gates, or high strength shattering acrylic can be used to create uh, a secure compartment. So that gives some additional flexibility as well. Uh, and in section 15418 raises the limit of the value of goods that be, can be carried in the vehicle. Um, and this is the retail retail value um, from $5,000 to $10,000. And it also eliminates that requirement that a portion um, of the goods in the vehicle be pre-ordered that, you know, that requirement that there had to be, there could only be $3,000 worth of retail um, with an order has now been eliminated. Um, so now that I that ice, tree, ice cream truck model as some people refer to it um, is now permitted and provided that the retailer have at least one delivery order before leaving the premises. Next slide, please. So over the last few months, um, we have seen an increase in the operators that we work with um, receiving regulatory inspections beyond just their typical annual regulatory check. Um, so we wanted to kind of emphasize that we do expect an increase in those throughout 2023. Um, we're seeing pretty deep dives on documentation, um, especially on the manufacturing side in terms of product quality plans, um, production batch records, details relating to what's been placed into metric uh, as far as your track and trace documentation. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out, but we would, did want to do an overview on um, some things you can do right away to be um, prepared for any DCC inspections. Next slide, please. Um, we always recommend an annual third-party audit of your license premises to identify any deficiencies or observations. Um, this is important because while your staff are present on site every day, um, there can be an easy miss where um, they're moving through their their day to day functions, checking the box and failing to recognize a very small area of noncompliance that can kind of snowball. Um, in addition to a third-party audit. We recommend preparing all managers for regulatory inspections or appointing an on-duty designated staff person to handle regulatory inspections in the event that the manager is not present, someone who's going to feel confident moving through questions and um, walking a regulator through day-to-day -day operations at the facility. Um, beyond just 
one on-point individual. Um, make sure all employees are prepared to cooperate with DCC personnel, um, law enforcement officers, and any other enforcement um, from any regulatory agency that may be performing an inspection. This is everything from fire safety, OSHA, anything that may be coming through. Um, next slide, please. Um, on a quarterly basis, I strongly recommend internal auditing for on-site managers. Um, where possible, if you've got multiple managers across several departments in your facility, um, encourage cross-training and cross-auditing of different departments. So it kind of is a mock of that third-party audit. Um, and move through some of these key details so that there's an increased cadence of accountability and understanding of how to move through and spot check each other's work when it comes to um, these high violation and easily spotted areas. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, don't forget about your other compliance obligations. Um, in addition to complying with the regulations that are put forward by the DCC, um, there are other key areas where we need to be focused. Um, we are seeing um, an increase in OSHA and EPA inspections. Um, and as previously discussed, um, we'll also likely see an increase in CDTFA audits. 